white men at the table discussing freedom. And after the revolution that these men helped plan, after that revolution succeeded, Elizabeth asked how come she wasn't included too. Massachusetts courts couldn't find a justification for continuing the institution of slavery in Massachusetts. And one woman questioning her status and that of her daughter led to the freedom of all of those enslaved within that state. But it did not lead to the right to vote. In many states, free black men did not have a right to vote. And of course, no women had a right to vote at that point. There was a brief time in New Jersey after the revolution where women with property could vote, but in 1807 when somebody noticed that there were some women voting, they closed that loophole. In both Great Britain and the United States, the rebellion of people against being enslaved made the institution of enslavement less and less stable. Especially in the United States, these rebellions then led to more and more restrictive laws, <clears throat> trying to control people, which then led to more and more people resisting the practice itself. In Haiti, a rebellion of those enslaved led to the founding of a black republic. And that Haitian rebellion inspired some, and it terrified others, leading to more restrictive laws, especially here in the United States. Some men spoke out about enslavement. And women in the United States who objected to enslavement also began to speak out. The Grimke sisters, Angelina and Sarah, are the most famous perhaps. They were born into a Southern family that enslaved people. And fully aware of what that meant on a day-to-day -day basis, these two women decided that their consciences could not tolerate cooperation anymore and in fact demanded that they oppose and resist the institution. They left for states further north, which might tolerate their speaking out. But even that was tolerated just barely. Lucy Stone and Lydia Maria Child were women who were white in the north who began to speak publicly about abolition as well. Because as women started speaking out of their consciences about enslavement, they encountered opposition to their own full humanity as women. Women, said the churches and politicians of the time, should not speak in public. There were also black women who spoke out and wrote, although they had fewer resources backing them and were in much more danger. Women like Sarah Maps Douglas and Charlotte Fortin. Charlotte later married one of the nephews of the Grimke sisters, um, sons of one of the Grimke sisters' brothers, and Nancy Weston, an enslaved woman. Nephews whose education the Grimke sisters, once they found out about the existence of their nephews, their education was financed by the sisters through Harvard and Princeton. Women began to demand rights of their own. First right they demanded was the right to be able to speak in public. And then they began to expand that to recognition of more rights in recognition of their humanity. In Philadelphia, as one example, people black and white, women and men, joined together to build an anti-slavery society, and not without opposition. Once that, great, that group barely escaped a mob that intended to burn down a building where they were having a meeting while they were in it. Both the interracial nature of the group and the fact that women were accepted as full members and were allowed to speak enraged many of the white male citizens in the city to the level that they planned mass murder. And elsewhere in the world, other forces were influencing some of these changes. In Europe and Latin America, the general idea of widening citizenship including voting, expanded. And in 1848, and I still regret my world history class, never taught about this, it was weird. Um, but throughout the world in 1848, revolutions broke out to demand such expansion of citizenship. 
The future father-in-law, Felix Adler, who founded ethical culture, was one of the key people in starting the Austrian Revolution of 1848. And when that revolution failed, he had to flee to the United States. Many of the immigrants to this country during that time were from the revolutions that had failed in Europe. And their voices in America were added to those already here for expansion of human rights. Well, that same year, 1848, a convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York. The women who started that convention, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, decided to do it when they had gone to a world anti-slavery convention and discovered that they were required to sit in the balcony and not allowed to speak, even though they were delegates. So they started a women's rights convention to look at women's status and what needed to change. The women and a few men who were there, including Frederick Douglass, drew up first what they called the Declaration of Sentiments, which, in which they echoed the Declaration of Independence, but included women. And instead of laying out grievances against the king, laid out grievances against what they saw as keeping women from full equality. And the next day, the convention passed a bunch of resolutions about what should change. Among them, for example, was this one resolved that the equality of human rights results necessarily from the fact of the identity of the race in capabilities and responsibilities. A really radical statement about equal rights. The women and men of Seneca Falls really did mean both uh, men and women and both black and white. Most of those who were working for women's rights at that point had been inspired to do so through their work for the abolition of enslavement. The only resolution that day that was contended and quite contentious, and it wasn't sure that it was going to pass, was this one. Resolved that it is the duty of the women of the country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. Many thought it was too early to ask for the right to vote. The story of the convention is that when Elizabeth Cady Stanton proposed that they include the right to vote, many others said that can't be included. It will make sure that we are totally ridiculed. It's too contentious. It was Frederick Douglass at that convention that day who stood up and pronounced, if there is any argument to be made, it must be made by opponents, not by the friends of women's suffrage. Let those who want argument examine the ground upon which they base their claim to the right to vote. They will find that there is not one reason, not one consideration which they could urge in support of a man's claim to vote, which does not equally support the right of woman to vote. And the only resolution that didn't get unanimous approval was that right to vote, although it was included. And it was the one that the press made the most fun of. But it was to take more than 70 years before that right became established in law throughout the United States. It was a long fight. And there were compromises often made along the way in the interest of that right. In two different periods, parts of the women's suffrage movement made serious compromises with racism. I've spoken on that before. And if you're interested in that, ask me for a copy of that talk by email. I'll, I'll send it to you. But the first compromise with racism came right after the Civil War. Women had put aside their right, their fight for the right to vote during the war. They were mostly women of the North, and they supported the war on the grounds that it would end enslavement. But right after the Civil War, when those passing the 13th to 15th Amendments explicitly gave the right to vote in those amendments to black men, that was the first time gender and sex had been explicitly made grounds for constitutional rights. The women's suffrage movement split into two. The larger but less remembered part of the suffrage movement supported the right of all to vote, black and white, women and men, but was willing to wait for the women's rights right to vote in the interest of black men getting the right at that moment. 
the smaller but more remembered in our history books part of the movement, in anger welcomed racism. Most of those leaders later regretted that stance and reversed it, but a lot of damage was done in the intervening years. It was not until the 1890s, more than 20 years later, that the movement came back together after that split, electing Elizabeth Cady Stanton to head the combined organization. She had by that time mended her split on a personal level with her longtime friend, Frederick Douglass. When it became apparent in the late 19th century that state-by-state -state victories were not going to be a way to win women's right to vote, the activists realized that they would need a constitutional amendment. And then it became clear to many of the leaders that the votes, the vote of at least one southern state would be required in order to ratify the amendment. And so again, there was compromise. Black women had begun organizing suffrage groups by that point and were very active. And they were asked to become invisible so as not to worry the South. And white women tried to sell women suffrage in the South by claiming that more white women voting would offset the threat of black men voting. <laughs> Many of the black women in the movement for women's rights did agree for practical reasons to be invisible, but not all of them. One example was Ida B. Wells Barnett, the anti-lynching activist. She was not among those who cooperated with invisibility. She insisted on the equal presence of black women as a matter of principle. Some of the white women activists also supported her demands and overrode the wishes of the suffrage movement's leadership. There was another compromise that is less well known in those years of the suffrage movement, and that was a compromise with religion. Again, there was concern about upsetting too many people if you had to pass a, a ratify a constitutional amendment. A committee of women, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton, published what they called the Women's Bible in 1895 to 1898. They, in this book, um, denounced biblical interpretation that they be believed was biased against women. And they highlighted the many positive roles of women in the Bible. But at a time when the suffrage movement was attempting to draw a wider circle of support, including among women of the South, Stanton's publication was felt by many in the movement to be distracting and even destructive of the goal of women suffrage. Stanton was asked to step down as president of the Suffrage Association. She died just a couple of years later. On the other side, there was a complicated relationship between the women's suffrage movement and the growing movement for working class rights through the unions and through anarchist and socialist movements. Many women were prominent in those movements, and yet the male leaders in those movements often preached to the women the theme of wait for the revolution for women's rights. Be quiet now. They believed and taught that these rights for women would be automatic once the revolution came. And the women were a bit more skeptical of that position. Crystal Eastman, who with her brother Max was a leading socialist figure, and who considered herself a feminist already in the early 20th century, wrote these words about that lack of support for feminism. It could have applied to any of a range of reform and revolutionary movements at the time. She wrote, all feminists are familiar with the revolutionary leader who can't see the woman's movement. What's the matter with the women? My wife's all right, he says. <laughs> she goes on. And his wife, one usually found, finds, is raising his children in a Bronx flat or a dreary suburb to which he returns occasionally for food and sleep when all possible excitement and stimulus have been wrung from the fight. <laughs> if we should graduate into this future tomorrow, this man's attitude to his wife, Eastman argued, would not be changed. The proletarian dictatorship may or may not free women, women she 
Well, the same complicated relationship was true of unions. Um, when a bit later the Pullman Porters, which were almost all African American men, organized their union, they were the first black union in America with significant power. Yet when the black women who worked as maids in the Pullman railroad cars wanted to join the union, they were told no. The objective, they were told, was to reproduce the white working class among African Americans. Men should be able to earn enough that their wives could stay home and not work. So they refused the maids' membership in the union. And that separation went both ways. Though these more radical women were often also feminists, they were not welcome in the women's suffrage movement, which worried that it could not win if the powers controlling the political process got scared off by radicalism. By 1910, though, it was clear that the many ways in which the suffrage movement had made compromises to appear safe were not working. State by state, there had been some states that had instituted women's suffrage, but it had stopped for years. And this realization became even more clear to the many women who put aside their pacifism it was also common among the suffragists and supported World War I in hopes that then they would be recognized as full citizens after the war. And yet that did not, as the war ended, translate automatically into women getting the vote. During that 1910 to 1920 period, in both British and American suffrage movements, women began to turn to more radical and militant stances chaining themselves to courthouses, picketing outside the White House, even picketing the arrival of the new president in Washington for his inauguration. <laughs> in England, breaking windows. One woman in England died when she stepped in front of the king's carriage as part of a protest. In America, women were thrown into prison for protesting, and when they staged a hunger strike, were violently force-fed some having lasting health effects for the rest of their lives. It finally took that addition of militancy to get woman suffrage won, and to get that extreme response by the government that created enough sympathy to get people to listen. So here's what I see as the wisdom of that learning. Both militancy and the willingness to be pragmatic have to work together. A compromise that compromises the rights of others does not work well in the long run for building connections. We need connections between the different struggles for full humanity and full citizenship for any of them to be successful. So how did suffrage finally pass? There's actually a very dramatic story, which many of you have probably heard. There was a point in August of 1920 when only one more state was needed. There were only two states that hadn't voted for or against, North Carolina and Tennessee. The Tennessee legislature was going to vote. Activists for and against the woman's suffrage amendment descended on the state to lobby and to be visible. Well before radio or TV or the internet, news reporters also descended on the Capitol to cover the excitement. The vote was going to be close. The suffragists had counted their votes and continued to pressure because they knew that they were probably short. The suffragists themselves were divided. There were two groups there in Tennessee, a more pragmatic group and a more militant group, and they were fighting. Not often credited, though, in this story are the many women of Tennessee who worked for women's suffrage and lobbied before and on that day. Women in Tennessee had the year before been given the power to vote in city elections, but not for state and national positions. The so-called antis were also out in force, and many of those against woman suffrage were women, alleging that women getting the vote was against the Southern way of life and against women's sacred place in the family. 
The antis were also opposed to the idea of any federal intervention in the right to vote because they saw that that might eventually threaten the state's ability to suppress the black vote. Legislators took red roses for their lapels if they opposed ratification and yellow roses if they supported ratification. The session of the legislature was called the War of the Roses. <laughs> and then 24-year-old Harry Byrne, a new member of the legislature, received a telegram from his mother urging him to vote for suffrage. Byrne had consistently voted against suffrage to that point. When he saw that with his vote against, the vote would be 48 to 48, so no ratification would happen on a tie vote, he did what his mother asked him to do. <laughs> and Tennessee became, in 1920, the 36th state to ratify the right of women to vote. There were a few maneuvers by the antis to try and reverse that ratification, but that November 1920, it was no longer possible to exclude women as women from voting in federal elections. Some women still were excluded for reasons of race or if they were Native Americans, but they weren't excluded as women. The turning point, I believe, came with the willingness of thousands to publicly protest what they saw as an injustice, a failure of the promise of 1776 and 1848. As that 1848 document declared, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that all are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. It just shifts what you hear there when women are included. And yet that document was not perfect. It also argued for women's rights on the grounds that voting rights were all, or that human rights were already given to quote, the most ignorant and degraded men. <laughs> not a helpful way to build coalitions for human rights. <laughs> Both the militant and pragmatic wings of the suffrage movement were sometimes elitist and racist in their language and action. So the wisdom of that victory and the fact that that victory was limited comes, I think, in recognizing four things that are needed for lasting change to enlarge human rights. And the first is the willingness of a large number of people to publicly protest for human rights and for government that serves all of the government and against violations of human rights and against government actions that serve only a few. Even that silly song we heard says it, though suddenly some need to be clapped in irons in order for all of us to cast off the shackles of yesterday. <laughs> protest, especially when it's not welcomed to protest, is important. But the second part is the willingness also of a large number of people, and there's some overlap with the public protesters, to do the hard work of political organizing, convincing people of the rightness of the cause, convincing legislators to change laws, and changing who is elected to legislate. Without laws, or with the wrong laws, or legislators, not much gets changed. And without organizing to change minds and change office holders, the legislators won't change the laws. So the third wisdom that I gather is that you need the presence of both militant and pragmatic forces for change, even though they will often be in tension and sometimes even fight with each other. This one is perhaps the most difficult for some of us to accept. But as I look back over successful movements for change, both pragmatism and militancy are always present. And both do part of the essential work of making that change happen. And finally, the fourth wisdom, in both militancy and pragmatism, beware of compromises that separate one set of rights from another 
and they put down one group of people for another. We are still mending the divisions of race, sex, and gender, class, elitism, and many other ways of prioritizing one group's identity and rights over that of others. Both militants and pragmatists have sacrificed others with lasting harm. I believe that both militancy and pragmatism in the future need to be much more mindful of who they are sacrificing and avoid such sacrifices. Long-term victories are only possible in the context of victories for all. So I'm gonna close with some words of an earlier feminist and worker for equal rights of all of humanity, Jane Addams. The good we secure for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secured for all of us and incorporated into our common life. The good we secure for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secured for all of us and incorporated into our common life. And that, I believe, is the greatest wisdom of the past and present struggles for equality and humanity. So I'm also very interested in what some of your responses are on the topic. Community responses, I think, in an ethical system.